on this edition of Chicago Tomorrow. But I think once a drug's released, that's not the end of the story. We'll meet a doctor who's leading the charge to have prescription drugs properly labeled. A Palm Pilot that's helping save lives in the ER. And we'll visit a lab that uses the latest technology to help its young patients walk. Elizabeth Brackett. I'm Aaron Freeman, and these are our gates, the rhythms and ambulations of our pedal extremities. What he means is, this is how we walk. <laughs> right. On this Chicago Tomorrow, we'll see how the Shriners Gate Lab uses computers to analyze and research gait to help kids walk. We'll see how one doctor researches dangerous side effects of commonly prescribed drugs. And we'll learn about the palm-sized database that could save your life in an emergency. One of the most common causes for hospitalization today is adverse reaction to prescription drugs. Is it possible that doctors are unknowingly writing a prescription for disaster? I'm lucky to be alive today. Patient X is a Chicago healthcare worker who asked us to conceal her identity. She was exposed to HIV, the virus that causes AIDS, from a needle prick while drawing blood from an infected patient. Her doctor prescribed nevirapine. This drug is commonly used to treat HIV-infected patients. Doctors also use it to treat healthy individuals who have been exposed to the virus. Shortly after taking the drug, patient X went into a coma with liver failure and was given three days to live without an emergency transplant. I read my pamphlet and it was telling me, you know, this and that, but like I said, it didn't tell me about the destroying of the liver or what it could do. Patient X says no one ever warned her of the potentially lethal side effects of nevirapine. The drug companies are not really doing what they're supposed to, and the doctors are not saying what they're supposed to. They need to give more information. Dr. Charles Bennett has spent the last five years trying to give people more information about the drugs they're taking. A professor of hematology at Northwestern University and the Lakeside VA, He's one of the few physicians in the country willing to take on the big drug manufacturers. One of the most common reasons for hospitalization now is adverse drug reactions from drugs. This is a common problem. This is not a rare event. Nevirapine is one of the drugs that Dr. Bennett has investigated. Because of his work, a black box warning now clearly alerts consumers to the potential hazards of this drug. In addition to its potentially fatal effect on the liver, Dr. Bennett also believes nevirapine causes a high incidence of hepatitis. These side effects are seen in healthy individuals who use the drug for HIV exposure, much more than those already affected with the virus. One of the first things that we did in Chicago was really figure out how many people were in the denominator, how many people really took this drug. We could identify eight healthcare workers who took this drug, and five of them get, got hepatitis, suggesting that the incidence might be 60%. Now the package insert clearly states this drug has a risk of hepatitis. and the HIV infected population, that risk is clearly known to be 1% or less. So we're seeing quite a big difference between the 1% or less that's noted in the package insert as opposed to the 60% that we saw here in Chicago. In February of this year, the manufacturers of nevirapine wrote a letter to the editor of the Journal of the American Medical Association responding to Dr. Bennett's findings. In it, they state, the risks of nevirapine remain undefined. They also state that use of nevirapine to treat healthcare workers for HIV exposure is not an FDA approved use of the drug. The problem is, is that many drugs that are approved for one indication will be used in other settings and used with good intention. With the, the thinking here is that this drug works quickly, uh, doesn't require a lot of processing the body to be effective, so it's just some of the other HIV medications, that it may be on that basis a very effective drug for preventing transmission from healthcare workers to, uh, or from infected patients to healthcare workers. But the, the toxicity in this setting clearly was unknown, and I think that's probably the most important part of, of what we're looking at. Dr. Stuart Johnson is an infectious disease physician who is contributing to Dr. Bennett's research into nevirapine. Part of the issue, I believe, is that we've had this accelerated approval uh, of drugs, and rightly so, 
where there is a very short period of time, historically, uh, looking back at it, from the time of discovery of the drug, testing in, in animals, and then initial patient uh, uh, studies, to approval of the drug. This time period has been contracted significantly with the concern of getting effective drugs out there for essentially a fatal disease. Is the FDA releasing drugs too fast is a question that comes up. I think the FDA does a very good job, but I think once a drug's released, that's not the end of the story. We should be looking for side effects of drugs actively, and we should have money to support that effort. Has anybody stonewalled you out there, drug companies, FDA? I can tell you I've been disappointed. With no federal funding or grant money, Dr. Bennett has performed all his research on his free time. His medical detective work began by chance in 1996, when an old friend of his father's contracted a very rare blood disease. Hi, Jan. How are you? Hi, Charles. How are you? Good, Good to see you. you. Good to see you. I want to see how you're doing. Oh, PTP well. is an unbelievably fascinating disease. Let me just say the words. Thrombotic, thrombocytopenic, purpura. It's like Greek. But what it really means is five things happen. The patient presents with fever, neurologic symptoms that look like a stroke, kidney failure, low platelet counts, and anemia. And to see a patient present with five different things at one time is unbelievably confusing to doctors. We like to see one thing at a time. I didn't know what was causing my problem. And I knew what I wanted to say, but you know, it wasn't coming out. So it wasn't that I had lost uh, my ability to think, but I couldn't say what I wanted to say. Jan Meister's cardiologist prescribed a drug called Ticlid to treat a heart condition and to lower her risk for a stroke. After a short time on the medication, she became extremely fatigued and unintelligible. Her cardiologist misdiagnosed the symptoms as a stroke. Mrs. Meister credits an emergency room physician with saving her life. He took a blood test and he knew immediately what was happening. And he said, this is TTP, it's not a stroke. By this time, my uh, platelet count, which is normally, I think, somewhere one side the other of 200,000, supposed to be anyway, uh, was down to 1,700. So <laughs> I was really almost gone. <laughs> it was while studying Mrs. Meister's case of TTP that Dr. Bennett uncovered some startling side effects of Ticlid. Well, at a medical meeting, Dr. Bennett ran into the leading manufacturer of the blood dialysis equipment used to treat Mrs. Meister. His detective work began when the manufacturers gave him the list of the hospitals and doctors who used their equipment. The next day, I called up the people on the list, the top 30, and every one of them had a case just like Jan. It was unbelievable. After one day of phone calls, we had 60 cases identified and 20 deaths. I knew we had something. And this was supposed to be a disease that was only four or five people in the world had? Exactly right. I thought to myself, either I'm the smartest person in the world, or we have something here that's much more common. Dr. Bennett's work has caused ripples across the medical and pharmaceutical world. Though Ticlid was not taken off the market, sales dropped from $200 million to nearly zero. Now Dr. Bennett is looking into similar negative side effects from the drug that replaced Ticlid. It's called Plavix. Plavix also helps to cut down on the risk of a heart attack or stroke. The drug's website shows that without Plavix, blood platelets can stick together and form clots. Plavix can help prevent that. It has been prescribed for 4.7 million people worldwide. But Dr. Bennett says Plavix can cause TTP, just like Ticlid does. We identified 11 cases that we reported in the New England Journal last year of cases where patients had the same exact side effect as seen with Ticlid. Now, we don't know the frequency of that side effect. We estimate the frequency of that side effect is about 1 in 10,000. Dr. Bennett says his research prompted the company to warn against the side effect of TTP in its package insert. The company says it occurs in only four cases per million. But Dr. Bennett says the risk is 25 times that. In response, the company says, according to a study by the American College of Cardiologists, Plavix lowers the occurrence of death, stroke, and new heart attacks in at-risk patients by 20 percent. The company also emphasizes that of the 12,000 patients in the study, not one developed TTP. 
We think that the drug should be used in a situation that's beneficial, but we only ask for monitoring, one to two weeks of blood tests. That's not much to ask for, but it's more than, it's curr than currently being done. That's the kinds of things that we think we could be influential in asking the pharmaceutical companies and physicians to change their practices slightly. Vice President Dick Cheney has also used Plavix to treat his heart condition. Is Vice President Cheney at risk? I think Vice President Cheney is not at risk because the side effects that we've seen occur within the first two weeks. However, when he took the drug in the first two weeks, I would be monitoring him with the blood test. Dr. Bennett believes active surveillance of new drugs is essential to ensuring the public's safety. And the current system is that doctors are voluntarily asked to report cases to the FDA. I've asked every doctor in the conferences I've been to how many doctors have ever sent a case to the FDA. The answer is zero, 95 percent. If it's not zero, it's one. It's never more than one because it's a lot of work and it's often more work than they want to do and they often not, they're not sure that it actually does anything at the end of the day. Drug manufacturers pay the FDA a user tax to get their products approved. Dr. Bennett believes this tax puts the agency in a scenario similar to that of the FAA's role in the airline industry. However, when something goes wrong with the drug, there's no NTSB to investigate the cause. How many lives do you think your work has saved? It's hard to say in terms of that. I think on the Todd Good story, we estimated that one in 2,000 people would have a side effect, 10% might die. So a couple hundred people might have died from Todd Good worldwide. That's a lot of people that we might have saved. For, for Plavix, we don't know yet. We estimated one in 10,000, and the drug sales with Plavix are estimated to be $2 billion in 2002, 2% 2 of the United States population. We could save 50 to 100 people's lives. If I save just one life, I feel good. Dr. Bennett asserts one level of risk. The drug companies assert another. How do we know whose assertions to believe? Well, you know, once an FDA approves a drug, they really don't go ahead and look at the side effects. And when Dr. Bennett found these adverse side effects, he talked to hundreds of doctors and found many, many more patients that had the same side effects. He did a statistical analysis, and that's how we found the risks were much higher than had been reported. These are anecdotes, but they're still considered statistically significant? Absolutely. Mm -hmm. And if you're taking one of these medications, or if you have concerns about any prescription, you should consult your doctor before making any changes. Your pharmacist is also a useful resource. And you can log on to our website at NetworkChicago.com. Here's another Chicago Tomorrow fact. Eleven prescription drugs have been pulled from the market since the fall of 1997. Coming up, an appliance for science, a database of drugs for ER doctors. Here's something most of us take for granted, the ability to walk from one place to another. This simple body motion is called our gait. Control of our posture and balance comes automatically for most of us. But that movement is a challenge for some. For example, kids who have cerebral palsy. Studying gait is not new, but gait patterns are too fast and complex to be fully observed with just the naked eye. So a running horse was photographed in a series of still pictures in the 1800s to find ways to improve its gait pattern for racing. Chicago Shriners Hospital is using digital analysis to record and analyze children's walking or gait patterns to help better design treatments so that walking can be a simple act. The Shriners, through their endowment and fundraising activities, uh, provide free medical care to children with the problems that we take care of, which is primarily orthopedics, spinal cord injury, and plastic surgery. Shriners is a, it's just a wonderful organization, uh, especially for physicians. We're allowed to be doctors here and be very focused on uh, the single goal of taking care of kids. Didi has osteogenesis imperfecta, a genetic condition causing brittle bones which break easily. Because we take care of so many children with problems walking, it became uh, obvious that we needed a way to measure this and to um, try to bring technology into the treatment of the uh, dis and the treatment decisions of what we did. Doctors and bioengineers have been working together in the gait analysis laboratory of Shriners Hospital to develop methods of analyzing and treating children with conditions that impair their ability to walk normally. The goal of the lab or gait laboratory is to quantitatively describe how a patient walks. And from there, we're able to 
compare their data to a person who doesn't have any kind of gait problems. What we do is we evaluate a patient by placing reflective markers on bony landmarks, starting with the pelvis, the thigh, the knee, the shank, the ankle, and the foot. And we go ahead and we place the patient in the walkway area. We have 10 cameras with strobe lights. And there's light that's being emitted and reflects off of the marker. And the camera captures the reflected light. OK, Dee Dee, when you're ready, can you walk down to the other blue bench? The patient walks across a force plate, which measures the vertical forces the body exerts. And from there, we're able to create a 3D image of the patient walking. Cameras in the gait lab can see about four times more detail than the human eye. Because the human eye can only discern you know, so many frames per second. And the cameras here can operate at 240 frames per second. So it gives you a much closer, detailed look at exactly what the, the abnormality is in their walking or their motion pattern. And from that, you can base your treatment decision. Eric was 15 months old when he was diagnosed with cerebral palsy. Doctors told his mother he would never walk. The gait lab is just so amazing. They are able to measure what muscles trigger when, when he's walking, and it helps them when they're getting ready to perform surgery. Eric's success might never have been possible without the gait lab. What we do is we place um, electrodes on specific muscle groups, and as they walk, the muscles fire, and we're able to measure this. It's like a muscle microphone. He's walking better than he has because he was walking with a severe knee flexion deformity before, and uh, you know now he isn't, and that's uh, it's a lot better for energy consumption and speed of walking and that sort of thing. He was walking before, but not on his own. He walked with braces and with crutches and with a, a walker. And he was never an independent walker until he started going through the gait lab and he had the surgery. This technology was developed for medical treatment, but in Hollywood, it's used for animation. This is almost like Star Wars because we're able to create a 3D image of a patient walking, pretty much almost like you're in a video game. There's many labs in, in Hollywood that use these to animate, for example, all the people falling off of the boat, off of the Titanic, and the, the data that they, come, that they get in is the, is the motion uh, that they get from uh, real figures. That information is then put into a computer that generates lifelike motion. When you're ready, walk down to the other side. So this is Diane. She's one of our young ladies with cerebral palsy who uses a walker for ambulation. And uh, we came with, up with a study or an idea for a study to look at children who use walkers to see which is the best type of walker for them to use and what are the important characteristics for a walker for children who need those for ambulation. And what is the future of gate lab technology? Oh, I, I think it's very exciting. In the future, it'll be possible for the computer to simulate the effects of any procedure that we might perform to see what the results of that might be before we even make an incision or do a surgery. That's what, I mean, life is all about motion and walking and getting from point A to point B. I caught myself. <laughs> all those services we've just seen, you know, the Shriners provide all those services for free. I know, so the next time you see them with their fezzes and their funny little cars, you know these people do good work. Absolutely. And for more information, log on to our website at NetworkChicago.com. Years ago, we expected our doctors to have all medical knowledge in their heads. That was unrealistic even back then. And today, medicine is a much more complicated discipline. So what's a physician to do? when there's just too much information to remember. One Chicago doctor has devised a solution that helps save lives by reducing error. Come on, what do you expect to see? Life in the emergency room may not always be as exciting and fast-paced as it is portrayed on television, but even on slow days, emergency physicians are often faced with making important decisions about patient care in a relatively short span of time. And to make matters even worse, 
there is now a massive amount of information out there which doctors must consider when deciding on how best to treat a patient. Dr. Mark Rosenblum, an emergency room physician at Northwestern Memorial Hospital, remembers how he tackled this problem when he was a resident. As a resident about eight years ago, uh, I had filled all my pockets with little crib notes about things, um, and I was using little cards. I filled up one whole pocket, then another whole pocket, and when I hit the third pocket, I was running out of space. So he decided to transcribe all his notes into the phone book section of one of the first handheld computers and carried it around with him all the time. Uh, every single rotation added, you know, 10, 20, 30 different diseases and different things. And any little thing that came up in the literature that I wanted to add to it, I added to it. And then I had a relatively big database after a while. This database was the beginning of PEPID, or the Portable Emergency Physicians Information Database. From its early days as random notes in a pocket, it has now grown to be not only the most comprehensive medical database around, but also a complete pharmacological resource, covering all prescribing information, possible side effects, interactions, and common overdose management for 1,400 drugs. But all of this information didn't just come out of Dr. Rosenblum's pockets. I recruited about 35 other physicians and five pharmacologists, and we went about writing things in detail, in depth, from every level. The original 35 experts have now evolved into experts from across the country and around the world who are section and group editors and who also serve on the advisory board. Dr. Rosenblum is now the president of PEPID. What Rosenblum likes most about PEPID is knowing that he can look up what he needs to know, whatever the department. situation. Um, I just looked through some of your medications and notice here on some that I actually haven't heard of before. Um, is that uh, Actos or something that you're on? Actos? Yes, yes. Okay. In the emergency department, um, you don't have time to sit back and reflect. You have to make very, very quick decisions. And sometimes you're faced with anything, you know, things that you've never heard of or seem a little bit off, and should you treat them differently? To look at the enzyme system and see all of the drugs that it interacts with. It actually interacts with, with erythromycin and clarithromycin, which are two drugs we commonly prescribe for pneumonia. Now, would you have remembered that? I mean, <laughs> would you have known that about Actos? I didn't even remember that Actos is P-O-glitazone. I mean, What's that? Oh, that's the, the... That's the name of it. So I knew there were some that sounded like troglitazone, pioglitazone, a whole bunch of other kinds of uh, anti-diabetic agents. Currently, there are about 3,000 PEPID users across the country, and the numbers are expected to increase rapidly. Dr. James Adams, professor and chair of emergency medicine at Northwestern Memorial Hospital, explains why PEPID has been a success. Well, people have created a lot of tools to try to support emergency physicians. Computer tools, reference tools, textbooks, computer aids, all kinds of, all kinds of devices. But all of them require the physician to leave the patient. This device took a massive amount of information, distilled it into what the emergency physician was going to need, anticipated the thought processes and, the, and the, the, what the physician was going to require to care for the patient, put it on a, on a palm device, and allowed the emergency physician to take it with them. Doctors now literally have everything they need at their fingertips. Weren't you guys supposed to learn all this in medical school? Absolutely. We've learned, we've learned to make decisions in medical school. That's how things are changing from 20 years ago. Um, we've learned how to tell if a patient is sick, and we have to have some idea what's wrong with them. You know, 20 years ago, the physician knew everything about everything. But now, you know, there's about probably 20 times more knowledge out there. And it's impossible to know everything about everything. You know, we're a decision maker, let's say. And we're part of a team. And we're trying to reduce errors and provide better care. And we need this kind of resource. In the U.S., 7,000 hospitalized patients die from drug errors annually. We got this story when I went into Northwestern's emergency room for an eye problem, and there's Dr. Rosenblum looking at his Palm Pilot. <laughs> he thought he was playing a video game. I didn't know what he was doing. <laughs> well, what I think is cool is that they keep Pepid's information current by having the, the, the database self-destruct every six months, and you pay another $15 to get the current data, which is neat. And Dr. Rosenblum says they're going to make uh, Pepid's for nurses, for emergency medical technicians, 
even for consumers, for moms. And dads. <laughs> but you can imagine that could start all kinds of fights. You know, people saying, well, Doc, I don't know. My palm pilot here says, my Pepe database says. You know, I asked him about that, and he said, actually, a better informed patient is an easier patient to deal with. So he was all for it. Good. <laughs> and that's our show. We've learned a lot about the value of applying information to create solutions. Solutions that allow doctors to save lives, to make patients aware of the drugs they're taking, and to give children a better chance at a normal life. Thanks for watching. For Chicago Tomorrow, I'm Aaron Freeman. And I'm Elizabeth Brackett. Bye.